benefit immensely from the work that this institute does, and, and indeed it has informed uh, some of my own paper for the Centre for European Reform. So if you hear anything that's familiar, I hope you just take that as a compliment. Um, the good news for, for academics like myself, for political scientists, historians, is that this is, this is boom time for us. Brexit has created a real opportunity and indeed a real expansion of the, in terms of uh, the number of students who apply for postgraduate study master's courses in European studies at Nottingham has soared and everyone's suddenly very interested in, in, in studying politics again. So good for us. Um, pity about the country. But in, in terms of the... Um, and in terms, indeed, it's, it's really opened up. I mean, I think, I think, quite frankly, a lot of people in the House of Commons were perplexed last December when the Right Honourable Member for, uh, for Old Bexley and Sigcup, uh, James Brokenshire, the Secretary for Northern Ireland, stood up and talked about how the UK now was claiming once again, all of the waters of Loch Foyle. And people were, were surprised at this. Surely no maritime border means that you know, the coast of Donegal essentially has, the Irish state has no right to any waters in Loch Foyle. But to understand that, you see, you need to you know, study your history because that, that, territory, that maritime claim goes back to the crown grant, crown grant of the waters of Loch Foyle to the governor and assistance of London of the new plantation of Ulster in the 17th century, who basically gave that grant of all the waters of Loch Foyle to what became known as the Irish Company. And the Irish Company held the rights to Loch Foyle right up until the early 20th century. Um, and indeed, then, the British state converted that claim into a state claim after partition on the island of Ireland. So for the, the right honourable member of Old Bexley and Sidcup to make that claim, he's basically leaning back to the Ulster plantation. And that in itself is unfortunate, and as you know, the rather delicate political dialogue that takes place even in the 21st century in Northern Ireland. All these issues were nicely submerged by our common EU membership, um, and now has suddenly re-emerged uh, to cause uh, some awkwardness in British-Irish relations. So as a historian who occasionally dabbles in the, in the present, I previously worked at the Centre for European Forum with Simon as a foreign policy fellow, I sometimes find it's quite useful to go back and look at what were the predictions about the island of Ireland 100 years ago. And reading Tom Kettle, MP for East Tyrone's book, The Open Secret of Ireland, he makes two rather bold predictions. He says, one, Ireland in the next 100 years will become much more European, much more deeply European. Good man, Tom. I think you got that one right. Full marks. Um, people wouldn't perhaps have seen that in Kettle's time. The second prediction that he made was that unionism, also unionism, was a busted flush. And ultimately, it could be quickly resolved by the Department of Education and will have nothing to do with the War Office. I think we can safely say that Tom Kettle wasn't so right in the, with respect to the enduring attraction or, or enduring appeal of Ulster unionism in Northern Ireland. And indeed, today, we are... I mean, looking at, at Kettle's predictions, he was in many ways um, very knowledgeable about Ulster Unionism. He was, after all, an MP for East Tyrone. Many of his friends were Ulster Unionists. Um, he lived and worked amongst them. But what he didn't predict was that he just couldn't believe, ultimately, that Unionists would ultimately resolve themselves to political and economic amputation from the rest of Ireland. He couldn't see why that would be rational. Um, and indeed... That, that instinct to some extent endures, that economic arguments don't often appeal to unionists. Um, if you consider the situation, for example, of Nathaniel Kelly, who was a farmer in Derna Wilt in the early 20th century, and indeed the grandfather of Arlene Foster. This was a man who farmed you know, a few miles from the, what became the border, uh, what was then the county border between Fermanagh and Monaghan, and his whole economic world was the town of Clonus. That was his business focus. That was where his commercial money was made. And obviously, when the border came along, that devastated the farm income of many Protestant unionist farmers in South Fermanagh. And indeed, the Kellys had to switch their economic focus away from farming to do other things. So they took state jobs, for example. Um, Arlene Foster's father, John Kelly, worked for the electricity board and the police. Because farming wasn't so viable anymore. Clonus was gone. And they tried to create a creamery in Derna Wilt. It failed. They simply couldn't really sustain, it was hard to sustain uh, a commercial business like that when your hinterland has been cut off from you in southeast Fermanagh. And the imposition of a border did have a devastating economic impact um, on, on people like Nathaniel Kelly. Uh, 
Um, but what is interesting is that ultimately they didn't really, you know, the, the severe economic blow was seen as necessary. That ultimately the border was seen as a protection, even if it meant um, economic duress. And a, a century on, the prospect of violence is obviously, thankfully, much diminished because, because of the fine work of Irish diplomats and British diplomats and indeed the political parties in Northern Ireland um, and in Ireland and in the UK over the last 20, 30 years. But um, that emotional attachment and indeed that visceral attachment to the union will indeed, I would argue, still trump economic arguments. So our misunderstanding, perhaps, of why so many could, you know, why the Protestant unionist vote overwhelmingly voted for Brexit um, means that perhaps we've just forgotten a little bit about this, this sense of, of attachment, that the sense that of putting up with economic duress so as to have no split, what's, because ultimately to make sure that nobody could ever accuse you of not being uh, patriotic, not being nationalistic, nationalistic when it comes to the United Kingdom. And Edith Arden Foster is an intelligent, capable woman. She knows the potential damage of Brexit, but the DUP is not about to make nuanced arguments about sharing sovereignty or, or placing Cuffston's border in the Irish Sea. And to think otherwise is, is perhaps a little bit, is, is unrealistic to say the least. So the disappointment that I felt living in Northern Ireland at the time, living in North County Down, was perhaps naive. You know, simply that, that any, any idea, any question that meant, that talked about dilution of sovereignty, no matter how economically realistic and to do with prosperity, um, would, would not easily find a nuanced answer in a community that had learned for generations to have a visceral reaction about the border and British sovereignty. Now, the government here is engaged in three, three uh, uh, simultaneous and ultimately very important dialogues. The first is with Brussels. And indeed, I would say Irish diplomats have excelled in influencing the EU institutions over the last year or so. And in certain, paragraph, uh, in certain paragraphs, for example, the recently released European Commission negotiating directives read like a summary of Irish concerns and objectives. However, I would say that there are, there are sections of, of, that, uh, of those guidelines that are potentially um, com complex for the island of Ireland. The first is that the, 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 uh, the EU talks about that preserving the status quo when it comes to human rights for EU citizens in Northern Ireland, i.e. that all Nor Northern Irish citizens who are simultaneously also EU citizens should not have any, uh, uh, any reduction in the current rights that they enjoy. Now, considering the commitment of, this go of the Conservative government in London, to looking at human rights legislation and revisiting it, especially with regards to what they claim is the ongoing uh, terrorism threat, I think that perhaps this could be a very thorny issue and a difficult issue in terms of future EU, UK, and indeed British-Irish relations. The second dialogue that the UK, that our Irish diplomats are engaged in is, of course, that bilaterally with London. To some extent, this has been you know, quite difficult, and you can see the frustration in Taoiseach Leo, Leo Varadkar's um, sense of how that is going and how difficult it is to, to read the runes when it comes to the Conservative Party. Um, and, and indeed, this is the intense, unresolved battle for influence over Brexit in the Conservative Party is deeply frustrating to the UK's partners. And as we've seen from the intervention by the Foreign Secretary at the weekend, very much unresolved to date. And a lot of people, including myself, were disappointed by the vague aspirational contents of the recent UK government Brexit papers that they produced, including especially on Northern Ireland. But Again, reading the footnotes of this paper is revealing and that London talks about, for example, precedence when it comes to special status for, that has been granted by the EU um, to other parts of Europe. It talks about you know, the access, the, the, the exceptions made in terms of trade for North Cyprus. It talks about, um, and indeed uh, British officials have also talked about the exceptions made for the Spanish enclaves of Ceuta and They talk about Bosnia and Croatia. Um, and they've even raised the idea of looking at, for example, how West Germany won exceptions for East Germany when it came to inner German trade in the 1980s. So there are precedent EU exceptions in terms of looking at regions that deserve special status. And the UK government has talked favourably about this. So it's not that London is against being persuaded that Northern Ireland shouldn't be given a special status. It can be. They are fearful about the reaction of the Democratic Unionist Party. And here is the third and perhaps most difficult and neglected dialogue that the Irish state is engaged upon, persuading unionism in Northern Ireland of, its, of Northern Ireland's future relationship with the EU. 
And again, to some extent, a bit like Tom Kettle, we are perplexed. We don't understand. Surely it is in Northern Ireland's economic interest to have a special status, an advanced status, and that ultimately if you know, the future potential Prime Minister of the UK, Boris Johnson, decides to sort of have an unreasonable negotiate, negotiation with the EU that leads to severe damage uh, to the UK's economy, surely there should be some type of parachute that we could find, or exceptions that we could find from Northern Ireland to protect peace and prosperity on this island. But ultimately, there has been a coarsening of language between North and South, between unionism and Dublin over the last number of months. And this is, this is negative, I would argue, because ultimately what UK officials and indeed conservative uh, front benches would accept is that the DUP are in a position of influence now. And that ultimately, you know, even though they will consider various options for Northern Ireland, dealing with unionist fears is, is very, very important. And how the Irish state engages with this is seen as also very, very important. And if there is a criticism of Ireland, it's to be seen that this relationship is, is becoming more difficult, more complicated, and there has been a sort of coarsening of public rhetoric. So what are we, what, what are we ultimately to do about that? Well, the challenge for Irish, Irish officials would be to persuade unions to ultimately accept some form of Plan B and Plan C. Obviously, what we all, what certainly I think many of us want in, in this room is that the UK would um, either, well, reverse its position, stay in the single market, the customs union, unlikely, I would say, more likely perhaps join EFTA, uh, negotiate a, a, a EU, a UK, um, very advanced customs agreement. But if all that falls through, we need to look at some exceptional status and some exceptional ranges in Northern Ireland. But how do we do that without? Relaunching sort of our, our reconfiguring the bogeyman of, of uh, Irish unity by stealth for the influential Democratic Unionist Party. How do we sort of allay these fears? And really, it's almost galling and ironic that a state that that's you know in many ways is committed to Irish unity as much as it can be achieved peacefully and consensually has to sort of think about laying the British identity fears of the Democratic Unionist Party, but ultimately that's what we have to do if we want to have influence when it comes to getting a Plan B or even a Plan C in place for Northern Ireland. So that's a dialogue that has been neglected and it's not going well. Um, and it's something that perhaps we need to be quite honest about. The Kenny text was received remarkably poorly in Belfast by unionism, unionists of all stripes, who were quite shocked what they saw was a reassertion of, of, of nationalist, nationalism towards Northern Ireland emanating from Dublin. Now, it shouldn't have been surprising. Of course, the Irish state was going to, you know, constitutionally, really, and traditionally, any teacher would have felt the need to, to, uh, to carry out his or her duty when it comes to making sure that Northern Ireland, if there is Irish unity in the future, that the EU will be able um, to easily allow this. This will not be a block. But nevertheless, perhaps the fact that this, there wasn't that intense dialogue with unionism, that I, I was quite shocked that they were shocked, but they were shocked. And they found it, they pointed out that the Fianna Fáil party, for example, has a new United Ireland strategy, um, that there is a new, uh, that there is a lot of dialogue in Dublin talking about how Brexit will lead to, ultimately to United Ireland. So some of, the, some of the rhetoric here, that's simply rhetoric, is taken very, very seriously in Belfast especially when it's by you know, some significant large parties like Fianna Fáil, etc., debating how Brexit will, as I say, lead to this inevitable, slow, irrational economic case for United Ireland in the future. So that dialogue is, is difficult. Um, but the other problem that we face is that, of course, the unionism particularly expects Sinn Féin to be government in Dublin quite soon. So, so listening to Dublin means, does that ultimately mean that listening to a future Sinn Féin government? So there's a, a, very, a very sort of delicate, uh, a lot of a number of concerns that, that uh, are not, you know, in some ways have to be dealt with um, and are not uh, simply born out of paranoia, but are very real fears about traditional political enemies being in positions of state power quite soon. Sinn Féin faces a major challenge as well, probably the biggest challenge it has faced since the, the peace process in terms of, is it going to be a party of protest or a party of government. I'm not talking about the South, but I'm talking about Northern Ireland. Ultimately, will it go back into the executive? Um, if it does, it will lose some of its more militant, long-standing supporters. Uh, very long-standing former senior members of the IRA have talked about that. You know, Post-Brexit, what they need to do is they need to make a big push for United Ireland now. 
And they need to do that by mobilizing outside the executive, not, not inside the corridors of power in Belfast. So there's a big debate going on in Sinn Féin about what to do. And some, indeed, some of their policy papers are really pushing for that more populist uh, approach in Northern Ireland. However, that would risk you know, really destabilizing Northern Ireland at a delicate time that might not be forgiven by their more middle-class conservative voters um, who may be spooked at the idea of political instability going on for a long period, much more, a, a long period in Northern Ireland. So they face a really difficult situation. They're also alarmed by the fact that the 1916 society is gaining a lot of traction in the border areas. Places like Fermanagh are seeing an uptick of young people getting involved in non Sinn Féin controlled republicanism. Not, 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 not violent activity, but political activity. And this is, they have noticed this in Armagh, they noticed this in, in Newry, they've noticed it in Fermanagh. And so it's causing, this is a real threat to Sinn Féin. They need to decide which way are they going. Um, they're also concerned, obviously, that if they go for a populist approach in Northern Ireland, then that's going to affect their chances of maybe scare off middle class voters in the south, restrict their chances of getting a mandate for government in Dublin in the future. So this is, for, for, not only for unionism, but also for republicanism, this is, this is, real, this is about as big a, a threat of the, as they've faced um, since the Good Friday Agreement. When it comes to, when it comes to looking at, at kind of bilateral state relations, I think we can, we can agree that the common travel area will endure. Um, and th there's no, Brexit doesn't really mean that, that, it shouldn't mean that this will be uh, ripped up um, or jeopardized, at least in the short to medium, medium term future. Indeed, UK officials are pretty, pretty satisfied that although they won't be monitoring and sort of trying to restrict the movement of people across the border, that operations like Operation Gull, which they do in conjunction with, uh, with Garda, with Customs and, and south of the border, that they can basically ratchet this type of thing up uh, to monitor the illegal movement of people across the border. And the other thing is that, it, of course, is going to be, you know, in terms of uh, uh, EU citizens will continue to arrive in the UK for tourism or other reasons. They won't have the right to residency, perhaps, but why would they come in the back door when they could come in through the front door? And anyway, is, there, is it really that attractive to being a legal EU citizen um, living and working in the UK? Arguably not to the point that they need to um, seal the land border in Ireland. So the problem that they face, however, when it comes to justice and home affairs is that even though, as Amber Rudd is going to set out today, the Home Secretary is going to set out today, even though they're absolutely determined to stay in as close as possible to Europol, to retain the European arrest warrant, how do they do this? if all these, these institutions, these tools, are going to be subject to the European Court of Justice oversight. And indeed, not only to the ECJ, but more recently now, because of new directors to the European Commission and to the European Parliament. So Amber Rudd has stated very clearly that Norway's operational um, agreement that it has in place with Europol is not sufficient for the UK's counterterrorism needs. Now, the UK is the biggest user and, and indeed the biggest um, contributor to key uh, justice and home affairs to policing and intelligence tools such as ECRIS or the Schengen Information, or Sy Schengen Information System 2 um, and it would be a huge loss for the EU to, to lose the UK in, as, as a sort of capable security actor in Europe dealing with um, serious crime and counter-terrorism issues but it's, it's hard to resolve some of the Conservative Party's steadfast rhetoric on European laws, courts, the European Court of Justice and then see how justice and home affairs can still work in a way that rather naively is being advocated perhaps by the Home Secretary without the type of detail and deep political commitment that we need um, in terms of compromise. So that's not, JHA is not going to resolve. How, how will that affect bilateralism ultimately? Well, the PSNI already do use the European Arrest Warrant frequently. It's a very important tool that it uses in Northern Ireland. Um, similarly, it's in, uh, the Security Service MI5 is increasingly using European intelligence tools um, so policing the border is made much more easy by these European institutions and tools. And a, re a return to bilateralism cr creates new potential for strain. First of all, because the UK is, to be frank, concerned about the, I would say, the amount of resources that the Irish state dedicates towards its uh, security capabilities and the fact that Ireland for a long period, indeed until quite recently, um, has not been, uh, has not linked up with uh, EU tools such as the Siena system that allows to monitor uh, Europe-wide crime, uh, terrorism activity, um, and a sense that the guard is, is quite frankly overstretched. 
um, before Brexit. So after Brexit, there is a fear that, you know, is there a threat? Is there a potential for Ireland to be, um, you know, is there a potential here of a risk to the UK from a weaker, too weak security apparatus in Ireland? I'd say then that those are real concerns. And they probably haven't gone away after the London attacks when Rashid Redwan, for example, was, was seen to have been resident in Ireland for some period, but had not, had not come under detection uh, by the Irish authority. So there is, there, there is a concern there, um, and that, that will, won't go away. Um, in terms of what are, the, what are the specific steps, then, that could be taken to minimise the effects of Brexit to Northern Ireland and, indeed, um, to the island of Ireland more widely? I think, well, first of all, the EU has one near unilateral option. It can maintain peace funds, and the UK has already said that that is absolutely in its interest, and it will also uh, make an unspecified contribution to that. So the peace funds don't have to go away. Peace funds can stay, which is certainly good for, for Northern Ireland. Um, it may also be possible, as Tishik has suggested, for Northern Ireland to still opt into certain structural funds. I mean, he even, Leo Varadkar even suggested that CAP, because agriculture was a devolved responsibility of Stormont, that Northern Ireland could also look at CAP, staying in CAP, uh, distinct from the rest of the UK. And that comes to another issue that will... that, that arises. Is it possible in a sort of worst-case scenario where the UK doesn't negotiate a deep and comprehensive free trade agreement, doesn't negotiate a, um, you know, a, a deep uh, a, a, a customs arrangement that doesn't mean that, uh, that that allows for more or less more or less seamless trade, or, or at least trade that is not heavily interrupted between the north and south of this island. Um, what, what could possibly be done? Well, the European Commission wouldn't rule out the idea of looking at uh, making Northern Ireland as an exceptional region. But as we talked about earlier, discussed earlier with a small group here, it's, it's very, very difficult to see how that happens without an incredibly complex fudge taking place. That means that um, either the, somehow Northern Ireland will adhere to both EU, depending on where it's sending its goods and services, will, will adhere to, on the one hand, EU standards and then also UK standards, and if the UK then wants to go and negotiate trade agreements with other countries, where does Northern Ireland stand? This is, so it is possible to, to get into that realm of complexity where you start trying to detach Northern Ireland to some extent from the rest of the UK in certain sectors, or indeed entirely. And perhaps realistically the most expedient thing to do would be just to create a border in the Irish Sea and say that, look, that is in terms of Either, either, you, either that that is the easiest way to, to guarantee on-island trade in goods and services. Um, but that obviously, given Northern Ireland's reliance upon Great Britain as a market, that's just probably not, a, it just, that's not a, a starter anyway either. So Northern Ireland is literally between a rock and a hard place here. So if we do go for the complex idea of, for example, allowing, trying to get Brussels and London to set up a, some type of regime whereby goods, goods and services that remain on island are exempt from tariffs, for example. Are exempt. So you have this sort of subsector within uh, that is agreed between the UK and the EU. This would be fiendishly complicated to do in terms of you know, policing, for example, the, uh, that these goods and services wouldn't be then further exported. Um, but according to the European Commission, uh, indeed in London, it's not impossible to think about. So they can think about doing it. Um, it would be just extremely difficult to implement um, and would possibly jeopardise uh, the ease in which uh, Irish exporters currently operate within the single market and within the European Union as a whole and the customs union. So that's, it's an option, but it's probably one that A, will meet political, serious political resistance in Dublin, and B, right now, is, is, a non, is really a non-starter for unionism in Northern Ireland. So what we're looking at here is, is a series of imperfect, very imperfect, extremely difficult uh, scenarios if the UK as a whole doesn't negotiate a very deep trade relationship with the EU going forward. But we might have to think imaginatively, we might have to think about where we don't want to think before about complex uh, island, a uh, single island trade zone. Um, and, and that could even impact upon, again, uh, Ireland's standing in the EU. But whether, again, whether the 
wh whether Dublin wants to do that is, is, is quite doubtful. Um, but it is an option. So, in terms of looking at, at the security relationship, I would say that Brexit will, be, will cause a, a series of challenges along all fronts. And indeed, it's interesting to listen to the Garda Representative Association who claim that really, in terms of trying to police a border, would be, require a serious investment in resources. Is the state willing to do that? Essentially, having to sort of you know, pay for uh, a, a neighboring state's um, decision to, to make uh, life in this island a lot more uncomfortable, a lot more difficult. That will require a, a, a sustained uh, conversation, a difficult conversation at home in Ireland. Um, we already have a very sophisticated, clearly smuggling letter from this country. Uh, so the resources needed to, to police that, that, these elements, political or otherwise, that would seek to take advantage then from um, the imposition of a new uh, customs border is clearly quite worrying. Um, and there's no easy solution to that either. The British-Irish Council would possibly have to take up some of the slack of a, a lack of EU institutions to, um, in terms of trying to sort of problem solve some issues around the border um, in the future. And indeed, even if the UK does remain within EFTA and does sign um, a customs agreement with the EU, you know, this will probably will need more bilaterals at some point. Um, uh, new institutions, perhaps, to try and uh, you know, solve issues such as um, deprived areas of the border, uh, trying to limit the damage of Brexit. So the British-Irish Council probably has a role as well. And again, that is something that uh, Irish and UK officials have been slow to talk about because all the emphasis is clearly on the Brussels negotiations right now. But these are things that, um, as, as the negotiations come clear, uh, that bilateral track will have to uh, take uh, well, that's become more pressing as well in terms of um, how do we replace the loss of, of certain um, fora and certain uh, agencies um, in the future as the UK exit the EU. As I said at the start, Tom Kettle was a daring man to make predictions and he made one very good one. Um, and it's very difficult to see right now where we're, we're going to be in five years' time, never mind ten years' time. Um, but what I would say is that on the, three, on the three strands, Ireland has had remarkable you know, tenacity and influence when it comes to working in Brussels, and it's a credit to, to uh, Irish policymakers and diplomats. But I would say that in terms of trying to secure any exemptions, whether it's structural funds or whether, hopefully won't have to do this, but looking at exceptions in terms of uh, cross-border trade uh, in, the in the wake of a failure of the UK and the EU to agree a, um, an enhanced trading or, a, 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 a deep and comprehensive trade agreement and customs union, then you know, we need to sort of prepare the ground when it comes to conversations with unionism. Because ultimately, although unionism will, although the DUP will take a back seat on Brexit, you know, nobody will fly the flag higher and are not going to give nuanced arguments about sovereignty. Ultimately, um, if the Irish government has a subtle and sustained uh, conversation with key sectors, for example, the Ulster Farmers Union, which is willing to listen and is concerned then you know, there is a potential here to have influence. There's a potential to, but it will come down to ultimately trying to reassure uh, us unionism that its identity, and this, is not, uh, this is not Irish unity by stealth, um, and that ultimately its identity and its place in the union um, can be secure while having some special, uh, special relationship or status with the EU. And that is arguably the biggest challenge for, uh, for the Irish state today. Thank you.